beautiful day out here. Anyway, uh, welcome to another episode of Crime Pays a Bounty Dozen. Now, as you can see, we're in a little greenhouse uh, just on the outskirts of Houston, Texas. We're going to go check out the cactus species Astrophyta mysterious and look at the many different forms that can be coaxed out of one single species, out of the genome of one single species. And then we're going to use that to get a little bit of an understanding of how evolution works. So let's go check out the many different forms and faces of the endangered cactus species Astrophytum mysterious. Okay, so here we go. Here's a quick intro into the genus Astrophytum. Six species in total, and here's five of them, and then you got the six back there. So you have Astrophytum myriostigma, Astrophytum ornatum, Astrophytum coriolens, which looks a little bit like myriostigma, but has denser trichomes, as you can see, probably because it grows in a very limestone rich, rocky habitat. You have Astrophytum capricorn, Astrophytum caput medusi, which used to be in the genus uh, Digitostigma and was only discovered about 20 years ago. Really, one of the most bizarre, not only species of Astrophytum, but mo most bizarre species of cacti in general. And then, of course, our friend Astrophytum mysterious, which is an endangered plant in the wild from South Texas. Okay, so those are the six species of Astrophytum. All of them will hybridize with each other, except put medusi just because it's so goddamn weird and what look like those tentacles or look like branches those are just elongated tubercles all right which i mean astrophyta mysterious doesn't even have tubercles all right tubercles are just little nipple like projections uh at the aerials all right so it'd be like you know if if this aerial was more stretched out and then stretched out you know a hundred times you know to form a, a tubercle uh, that's what that's what happened here. So at some point in the evolutionary history of the common ancestor that this has with all the others, there was a form that uh, just the, the tubercles just elongated, had experienced a chance mutation, maybe a series of chance mutations, and those tubercles elongated so much that you just have what looks like a fucking squid turned upside down in the ground with all its tentacles sticking out, and that is a flower bud sticking out of those. But it's still got that intense trichome patterning, and uh, it's also got... Well, this is a grafted one. This is not the actual body of, of it, but all this, this, it's got this, uh, this tuberous root, which would of course be underground uh, in habitat. This one is nearly impossible to find in habitat uh, unless uh, it's flowering. And, and this one too, I mean, you could be standing right on top of Asterius, but it's just, it can sink into the ground. It's, its roots can kind of pull it into the ground during times of drought stress, and it will just, it will, it will facultatively hide. All right, and of course, this looks like this guy looks like a fucking rock. So I mean, if that's is growing on a shelf of limestone, you're gonna have trouble finding that too. So anyway, so that's a quick intro into the genus Astrophytum. Let's go look at what's going on with seed production. Okay, so moving on into the greenhouse right here, you see we get the tiki head. We get all the nice stuff right here. Now we got a couple different species of Astrophytum here, but these are all Astrophytum mysterious. And what you're looking at right here are variations in that white patterning, i.e., the trichomes variations in the amount of ribs which are these different lobes uh on what is basically just a flattened stem that's all astrophyta mysterious is it's a spineless cactus that uh that just is basically just a flattened compressed stem resembling a sand dollar so these represent hundreds of of germinations okay each one slightly different from the one next to it just by chance uh mutation and uh you know, basically as a result of uh, genetic recombination via pollination events. Now, Astrophyta mysterious is not self-fertile. It's, it's not a self-fertile cactus like Lophophora, like peyote. All right, most cactus species are obligate outcrossers. I think like something like 70% of them, uh, at least in subfamily Cactoidae, are obligate outcrossers. That, so that being the case, uh, you get uh, good genetic diversity uh, just by default, all right? Where something that's con you know constantly banging itself may not have very good genetic diversity. That's the problem with uh, you know being a self-fertile species. You get all those recessive alleles. Many of them may not be adaptive. You know, you have low genetic diversity. You just get low genetic diversity stacking up. So you don't have many, i.e., genetic tools, como se dice, in your genetic toolbox uh, to uh, adapt to changing environments. So, you know, it can, uh, it can be very bad. You also get, uh, you know, the, the maladaptive traits uh, stacking up too. That's what was happening with, you know, like uh, the Kingdom of Spain back in the day. They kept banging their cousins. And so, you know, get all those, all those different genetic traits that would uh, pop up that, uh, you know, would lead to uh, problems on down the line. Anyway, 
uh, you could see right here uh, what we're looking at that variation look at that that's incredible look at all that look at all those different trichomes that variation is just a result of uh, however many genes whether it's uh, it's probably quite a few that code for trichomes and for trichome patterning and how the trichomes are produced in that apical meristem the apical meristem where the cells are actively dividing is again right there in the center of that plant so they kind of they emanate out all right and uh, this is the older tissue the further on down the stem you get uh, that's the older tissue the newer tissue is right there okay so we're going to talk about alleles allele is just a copy of a gene there can be one to a few different alleles that code for the same thing a one to a, a, a few different versions of the same gene that's codes for something like trichomes all right you have dominant and recessive alleles that's the simplest way to think of it the dominant ones are going to be the ones that override the recessive ones if a zygote gets the dominant and recessive the dominant is going to show up if it gets both recessive the recessive is going to show up so most of these traits are recessive alleles okay so they will be overridden by dominant the dominant alleles the dominant copies of that gene if they get the dominant so that's why if you like take this v shape if you grow a hundred uh, seeds from one of these V plants or even from both V plants you'll only get 20 seeds that come out with that V shape 80 of them will just be normal astrophytum asterius they won't be the fancy fancy lads like this okay so that right there uh, is is a good indication of what we're working with here of, of the intensive breeding that's taken to keep these forms these these phenotypes stable all right but again this goes into the the inbreeding the inbreeding comment all right this is what was you know all those monarchies that were banging their cousins that's why they had trouble if you continue to breed you know you you grow 100 seeds you take the 20 out that have the v-shape you throw the 80 other ones away and then you breed those all right and you keep doing it so on and so on with each other or back cross breeding whatever eventually four or five generations down you're when you grow 100 seeds you know from a parent 100 or four generations down most of what you get you're going to get more than 20 seeds that produce that v-shape you might have 40 or 50 etc so you're emphasizing you're accentuating uh that recessive allele so that it becomes more more dominant in the population it's still a recessive allele all right so there's if there's still a zygote you know i.e a seedling uh that gets or a seed even that gets the dominant and the recessive the dominant is going to show up but eventually you're coaxing out the dominant uh allele so it's not there anymore so you mostly have recessive alleles in that population again astrophytum mysterious is a great way to study evolution this should be in every goddamn evolution textbook as far as i'm concerned all right and it's cool because a lot of these breeders you know they may not they, they may not know much about evolution offhand but they certainly learn it through the process of breeding all these beautiful freaking plants god damn it well, over here you could see all these grafted bastards which is the process by mixing uh two unrelated genetic individuals not unrelated they're in the same family obviously but uh this is hyloserious dragon fruit being used as the stock and then the plant that's being grafted to it is one of any you know the five species of astrophytum that i just showed you including kaput medusi look at this bastard right there and look at that uh tuberous root or maybe it's more it's technically an underground stem you can look at all the trichomes sticking out the top of that and of course those elongated tubercles which look like tentacles now the purpose of grafting okay it doesn't look that pretty right and in fact madam cacti the owner of this greenhouse who was kind enough to let us come in here and film so i could show you guys what the hell's going on here all right uh she she doesn't like it she's you know she's she's a perfectionist she don't like the way these look she's just using them for stockman she almost didn't want to let me film these but i had to beg because this is so cool what you're doing when you graft is you are drastically speeding up the growth rate of of the plant that's being grafted to okay so what's being done here is these are being used as stock plants for seed production they are getting just flush with so much nutrients because dragon fruit grows a lot faster than many of these astrophytum spe species the dragon fruit the hyloceres that they are just getting continuously injected with nutrients and moisture and uh just growing you know exponentially faster than they would in habitat or even in cultivation so the benefit is they just continuously flower and flower and flower so what we're doing here is just basically you know she'll she'll breathe them she'll she doesn't use a paintbrush she actually takes tweezers and removes the individual stamens 
from one plant and will put it in the stigma of the other plant. That's the most effective way to do it. You could also use a paintbrush, but you know, actually using tweezers to remove stamens seems the most. So you could see all the different cultivars she's she's breeding. So she is basically she's getting a first-hand experiment experimental test in how evolution works. Look at this. Look at this. This is a Kiko cultivar. All right, look at this thing. Look at that. It's an Astrophytum Myriostigma Kiko cultivar. Look at the, it looks like a goddamn ninja turtle. Incredible. So pretty. And again, only in a few decades were many of these brought out. And were many of these, you know, you get, you grow a hundred seeds, you get one that looks weird, breed that one. Maybe now you get two or three that look weird. You breed those, back cross them, etc., And you get, you're just basically taking those recessive alleles and stacking them up within a population so that eventually you have more recessive alleles than you might otherwise have in, in a wild population. And so that's how you continue getting, uh, you know, these, these different forms. Okay, so we should mention everything here is seed grown. None of these plants were purchased, okay? Uh, initially she was buying seeds from overseas, but this is actually a weird, this is kind of frustrating too. Since Astrophyta mysterious and many other cacti are CITES listed, that is conservation and trade of endangered species, even if something was not poached from habitat, say it was grown in a greenhouse in, Th in Thailand when its native habitat is here in the U.S., you still can't trade it. So she was ordering seeds, didn't really know it was, uh, you know, illegal. And then customs kept seizing them. So she said, all right, fuck this. I can't do this anymore. And so now she's got to get seed domestically. But by that point, thank God she had already germinated so many. Anyway, let's look at the what's going on here. This is a Astrophytum Caput Medusa, uh, only described from Nuevo Leon and Tamaulipas 20 years ago, found by some guy who was a botanist who was doing a survey for the power company, a friend of my friend Carlos. Together they wrote the paper on this. Incredible plant, very rare this is a two-year-old seedling, okay, which is which is insane to think about how fast she was able to get this to grow when she germinated the seed maybe two, two and a half years ago. Once you graft these, and you can graft them when they're very young, they just they just explode. They just take off, all right? I, you know, there's a, I know a guy who's worked with Native American Church who's doing that with peyote, which is a very, I mean, he gets golf ball-sized peyotes from, you know, from within nine months from germination from grafting them to Paresciopsis, et cetera. So this is a really cool way to get tons and tons of seed, all right, especially from cacti that are critically endangered. This, who knows how many individuals there are in the wild, maybe a few thousand, not that many. It was rare when they discovered it and described it, okay? But again, right here, look at this. This thing just can perpetually flowers. Every flower is a potential source of hundreds of new seeds when you cross it with another individual. So. Uh, anyway, this is, uh, again, that, that Astrophyta myriostigma. Myriostigma, the normal one, the wild one, the species one, has tons of trichomes. This is a mutation that doesn't produce that many trichomes. It's the Kiko cultivar, and further on that, it's the Kiko nudum cultivar. Nudum because it doesn't have any trichomes. Look at this. Look at this Asterius. Look at it. This one has trichomes. Same species. This one has tons of trichomes. This one has like a turtle back shell. This is like a tortoise shell. It's just, it, it has always blown my mind. I've been wanting to make this video for a few years. It's always blown my mind how much variation there is in the Astrophytum Asterius genome. Again, which is really beneficial in terms of the longevity of the species. When it's faced with environmental stresses, environmental difficulties, uh, it can, you know, it's got much more in its genetic toolbox to be able to play with, uh, you know, when new seed is germinator, right? Because there's gonna be just, there's just so much potential for, for, you know, genetic variation and mutation, all right? But I don't think the species saw all the habitat destruction that was occurring, and which is why this plant is actually endangered in the wild now. Just tons of habitat destruction, conversion to agriculture, and conversion to the retail car-dependent death cult as well. So, Jerry, tell me about these. What do we got here? Who's this? Uh, this is stigma. Okay. And then this is the Meristigma nodome. Okay. And then this is the baby Coelens. Co Co Coelens, okay. Yeah, so this is a different find. species. Yeah, this is a different species, but they're the same. You can only identify them according to the flower. So it's said that you need to wait like several years. So they're closely related species anyway. Okay, and who's this over here? This is still Meristigma nodome. It's supposed to be, um, like what you mentioned before, it's supposed to be a polio cultivar, which is supposed to be red. Uh huh. But, um, Look, it's green instead of red. So were so, these all from the same seed batch? 
Yeah. So all from the same pollination yeah. event. Yeah. And all these all from the same pollination event. So this so this is a, so these are this was in the same pollination event, mm -hmm. and there's already tons of variation in here. Some of these are super twisty. Yeah. There's some that have denser trichomes, etc. And which this is a mirror stigma too. Yeah, these are all mirror stigma here. Four, six, eight. That's the only one among all of these. So this one. Wait, oh my God! So this has this one has it's a rare thing. Has a recessive allele that codes for more ribs yeah, multiple than the statin. other ones. Right, and this one. What was the one you were pointing to before? Oh, that this guy. One. Yeah. It's okay. Like, so that might be one that you select out of the whole tray. Yeah. And further try yeah. to. That's what I ha happened over there. Those are selective siblings there. These are all selected. Yeah. So I'm se I select them so that I can breed them in the future. Okay. So are these from all the same batch of seed or what? The steers really pop seeds for me real good. You like get a, you get hundreds of seeds yeah. from the same. And so right in this, I mean, you can see the variation that yeah. came from the, all the same germination event. Yeah. Or the same, excuse me, fertilization event. Yeah. That's crazy. So that's that right there is a good example of Mendelian genetics. Look at the variation in ant. It's just like those purple and white flowered peas all over again, but in the form of a critically endangered cactus. So yeah. tell us, so what are we looking at here? These are the ba baby Asterias. And how old are these guys? Probably uh, five months. What, so what is this? These, these are just... They got thirsty because they're... Got oh, okay. Crowded. So these, these were a little bit stressed. Yeah. So this is not stressed. genetic. This was just the result of... Yeah. Stressed. Um, of topographic changes within the flat. Maybe they yeah. got a little drier than the rest. But, yeah. But all these different trichome patterns and assortments, mm -hmm. those are good indications of genetic variation within the same batch. And they've got relatively large seeds for a cactus too, right? I mean, yeah. you can still see some right there. Looking mm -hmm. like almost like little corn kernels. So when would you separate these? Like right about now? Yeah, it's ready to be separate. And then I don't have space. <laughs> <Can> right. <you see? laughs> I see. I see you are a little. So, but that's what you would do is you would take like a handful, pot them up in a, in a yeah. individual container and then just keep going. Yeah. Okay. So what do you got here? This is Astrophytum caput medusae, the really cool and really weird one, yeah. grafted onto Myrtillo cactus. Yeah, hopefully I can get seeds from them, and um, grafting is very nice. Uh, it'll speed up the growth of the plant, and then um, mainly grafting for me is just to collect more seeds. And then what's good about Myr Myrtillo cactus is that it's steady, the growth is so steady, and then it's a long-term stop. You, you don't need to worry because the hylocereus is kind of like a temporary stuff. So the hylocereus will end up getting too small, too yeah. top heavy and yeah. breaking. Whereas this, I mean, this turns into like a big candelabra, mm -hmm. like up to eight feet tall yeah. cactus at times. It's obviously not going to get like that here because it's putting all its growth into yeah. that. How often do these uh, stock plants form side sprouts you got to remove? Um... Every once, like one that one, I guess, it. yeah. Like once in a while, yeah, but then you just take them off, yeah, right? Yeah, and then that's it. Probably it'll, it'll uh, give me like two babies, and mm -hmm. then that's it. Yeah, it's, I find it really interesting you're using Myrtillo cactus because that's better for this climate. Some people use Trico series for yeah. cactus grafting, but being that it's it's Texas, it's a little too hot and humid for Trico series. I don't think they would do too well. So how old are these grafts? Mm, I got that early last year, mm -hmm. spring. Out the seedlings, I graft out, germinated in four months, and then plus another year worth of graft. Oh, so it's okay. So they were like four months old. Yeah. Now. But either way, this is an under two year old plant. Yeah. That was just a home despot plant. It's just yeah. a plant you got. For, it looks maybe it's Pelosa serious. I can't tell. But either way, Myrtillo cactus is the one that's really doing all the work here. It's the best working one. Now, what is this? This is not a cactus, even though it looks like one. These warty bastards, but they are beautiful. And they, they are mildly reminiscent of uh, the Ninja Turtles, right? <laughs> this is Pseudolithos, you said. Yes. So milkweed family, Somalia. So what's with these? How did you germinate these seeds? How old, how old are they? I think they're like eight months old. And these are really prone to overwatering, right? Yeah. You got to keep them. How often do you water these guys? Mm, maybe once every two weeks. Okay. So they, and do they have like a tuberous root in the ground or what does Not it look? Really. No. Okay. Just and what's the mix you use on these these same with the soil mix i have with the astrophytum um 60 organic 
and then 40% inorganic. Like perlite and... I don't use perlite when sewing because I think perlite will attract mold stuff. Okay. Like green stuff. Okay. What do you use instead? Um, I use Turfis. MBP or cat litter. What you got right here is a milkweed that is evolved to resemble a rock. All right, it's basically just a stem that resembles a rock. Same thing many cactus species are doing to avoid being uh, eaten because it grows in a dry environment where anything that is green is going to be on the menu for herbivores. And look at that warty texture to it. It's such a cool plant. You could really see it's a milkweed when it puts out a flower. It looks, it, it's got that Asclepiad look to it that uh, that milkweed flower look but hey look she's growing areocarpus retusus too talk about talk about plants that resemble rocks all right maybe not now but certainly when they're larger that is a very cool plant from Nuevo Leon. You'll, another plant you'll be standing right on top of it unless you're looking for it you may not even see it that's seven months old right there which again i mean i think she's just a wizard at growing cacti you know, that's, that's all it comes down to. That's really fast. And then, of course, our native Texas Echinocactus Horizontalonius. Native to West Texas. Look at that. Seven months old. And so these are Kabuto, too. Yeah. So tell us what Kabuto was. So Kabuto is just a, it's a selected Japanese cultivar of Astrophyta mysterious that was developed, when did you say, in the 50s, you think? Yeah. Actually, it is uh, one of the plant that was harvested in the habitat and bring it to the to Japan and then they just um, developed it better and then the cab word kabuto meaning is a uh, helmet uh, uh, armor in Japan that has white feathers so that's why they call it um, kabuto because it looks like a little helmet with yeah, white feathers on it yeah. so even in and that's what kabuto is over here even in kabuto there's variation when you breed when you interbreed kabutos yeah and then they they have the V type, and then they have those uh, snow type. The snow type super kabuto is like covering almost like ninety percent of the epidermis of the plant. That's all white. It just the like whole plant this. looks almost white. Jesus Christ! Oh my God! Yeah, that guy's growing slow. Maybe because it's there's not as much chlorophyll. Yeah, exactly. There's not as much green. To, but that's definitely one you would select for. Yeah. And take out and then try to. Yeah, just like this. Too. Try to keep going. Basically, yeah. trying to just emphasize uh, those uh, those recessive alleles. What the shit? What is this? What is that one with the knee? It's got. It's a. Is that yeah. an astrophytum with spines? It's just um, rare. It's like one of a thousand. So there's there, that that's insane because I've never seen an astrophytum that actually produces spines before. Yeah. But this was a mutation. What was the seed bash that this came out of? It's just random out of from the seeds that I get before. So maybe that's a there's a family line that was crossed with Capricorn. Maybe five maybe generations years, back, yeah, ten like generations that. back. So those Capricorn genes are in there, yeah. and just don't pop out. They're one in a thousand. So how old are these guys and what seed batch are they from? I think these are like uh, 14 months old. They're slow. Because mm -hmm. this is a two-head plant, so this is one plant. Oh, wow. It's so just got two, two stems. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, so this, but what, what seed batch is that from? Was it, were these were all from the same seed batch or what? Yeah, exactly. They Jesus are. Christ. That is, this is, this, this has got to be in every evolution textbook out there. Perfect illustration of Mendelian genetics. That is like, take, that's taking recessive alleles to a new extreme. This is one you're obviously going to be selecting too and taking out and trying to breed with other spined yeah. versions yeah. of it and maybe develop your own cultivar once it becomes uh, prevalent enough mm -hmm. where you can grow 100 seeds and get like 20 that come out like that. Yeah. Then, it's, then it becomes like a new cultivar yeah. or what? If you have the patience to do it, probably, you know, like five years to 10 years worth of work. It can be done just like the Japanese people do. And you've only been doing this three years, you said. Three years. So in three years, you become an expert at breeding cactus. That's pretty. <laughs> that's pretty remarkable. And no botany training whatsoever. No, no. no schooling. Nothing. Were you? Just were you? YouTube. Just watching like your. Were you? Video. Were you growing plants before this? Mm -hmm. Not even edibles. You just one day, post COVID, in the depths of the pandemic, you're like, I'm gonna go down this wormhole. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, what? So this this is Astrophyta mysterious. This thing. Yeah. This, How? This is a, a Kiko How? mussel. Oh my God! It's beautiful. It's the most beautiful green tumor I've ever seen. 
What? Is, yeah. What is that? What do you? I mean, what does that do for? Like when you see that, what do you think of? Like it's just you just enjoy the form mm -hmm. that's brought out. It the, looks like a brain. It does kind of look like a brain. Yeah. It's really like a perfect. It's almost like a perfect sculpture. I always say nature's the best artist. You know, yeah. people. There's some good humans out there, but they'll never be as good as nature. 95%, 90 to 95% cultivars of Astrophytum is really developed in Japan. And then Thailand is just so good in mass production. So. Yeah, why is it? Because Thailand's like hot and humid, right? Yeah. But they just really know what they're doing over there. Yeah. I think the game in Japan is just like making a new cultivar. That's their passion. And then in Thailand. They just want to see like this, like tons right. of um, plants. Right. They just really, they're good at just mass producing them and growing them and yeah. giving them what they need. Yeah. So what's going on with this? You got the variegated ones. Are those ones that you germinated or what? Yeah, I germinated it and then uh, micrograft. Okay. So how small was it when you, when you grafted it? Probably uh, something as small like this. Oh, wow. Okay and then just grow like this. Mm -hmm. And you just do it with a razor blade and what do you use to hold it on yeah. to the, what do you use to hold the scion onto the stock plant once you... Um, I use like sometimes rubber band and sometimes um, tape. Tape, just scotch tape over yeah, the top. Wow. Tape. And so these, I mean, if you took that off, would it even survive? Probably not, maybe. maybe. They kind of need to be grafted, those ones do. Yeah. Because they're not, they're just not producing enough chlorophyll mm -hmm. to yeah. efficiently so. photosynthesize, yeah. So you would to to breed it. You would take tweezers, rip uh, rip an entire stamen off, and go place it in the stigma of another blooming plant. Yeah. And what do you do if they're not blooming at the same time? Can you freeze pollen or anything? Or um, I'm not to that level yet because <laughs> I just I pollinate them, and pollinate. But if I have like an extreme plant, like for example this one, I need to store the pollen if this uh, flowers because I wanna. Because it's just so rare yeah. and weird. Yeah. You're right. So to study farther. Yeah, I have I have never seen I've never seen an astrophytum with spines before. That's fucking wild. Jesus. This this is really weird. This is exceptionally weird. So what are we looking at here? This is Astrophytum Myriostigma. What cultivar is this? Um this is a cultivar Pocorio uh, type B. As in boy. Yes, yeah, boy. The type A is this one here. So can you see um uh, Focorio means aborted ribs. Mm -hmm. So um, you can only consider Focorio if the um, it alternates up, uh, with the real ribs, then the Focorio or the coastal ribs. These aborted ribs. ribs, these ones that yeah. terminate halfway yeah. up the stem. So if it's alternate, that's a type A. Mm -hmm. And when it go crazier than that, it's a type B Focorio. Yeah, this is insane. That's a, but exceptionally cool looking as well. And this one has trichomes on it. So again, these are all the same seed batch. Mm -hmm. So this is all the same fertilization event that happened. Uh, well, I guess every seed is definitely a different fertilization mm -hmm. event, but on a larger spectrum, it's they're all from the same flower. But this is this is the amount of variation you get from the same uh, fruit, the same ovary. Okay, so what what is this? This is a kabuto, an Astrophyta mysterious kabuto, is that yes. right? And then it's got pups coming off of it because it's just it's being so pumped full of juice. It's being so roided up yeah. by that hylo series beneath it. It's formed offsets now. So could you could you cut those offsets off and then root them? Yeah, sure you can. And then um, with Asterius like that, you can call them um, Florifella. That's the, right. that's the cult, cult of, of our name? Yeah. Florifilla. It's a popping um, asteria. So your plan with all these is eventually going to degraft them and put them back in the soil. Yeah, because okay. they deserve to sit in the soil. Because they deserve to sit in the soil. It's like an integrity thing for the yeah. plant. You you love these plants so much. So much yeah. Right. And even in Japan, too, it's like um, the plants degrade its value. So you have to kind of like let it root in the soil and to regain its you know majesty again or mm -hmm. something and this is this is gymno calicium you yeah, got all these gymnos too and this is common i mean you'll see a lot of these like in home depot right like the yeah the, the moon cactus right right the grafted gymnos yeah. yeah here's another trait that i've seen in a lot of the breeding astrophytum these these dimpled lobes where it comes in like that that star shape right so is that that's a that's a kind of like a choice trait to select for huh yeah that's a cultivar uh, called uh, star shape and uh, 
this is a wild type because this is it only has the little speckles right or the trichomes but you can also see a star shape that's super kabuto like this We're, oh yeah look at that so that's more of like yeah it looks more like a pumpkin kind of yeah so it just gets those dimples in between the ribs they're more mm -hmm. sunken in yeah then this one of course you get the ribs that that abort halfway yeah. up the stem which is another god look how pronounced they are in that that mm -hmm. is beautiful it's like looking into fire all right looking at the trichome patterns of some of this you know it's mesmerizing yeah like look yeah like look at that one that so you come out here some days and you just you just lurk and spend time it's yeah. got like a therapeutic effect yeah and um, it feels like you haven't seen them ever <laughs> right it's like you see them for the first time right like every time it's new yeah. what's going on here is that forming it's got like ribs forming in the center yeah, of the um it changes it could be a focorio before that's the thing about astrophytum it changes over time so uh, I selected that one because it looks like this, a Goryo for Goryo, and then it disappeared. So, <laughs> and it now it's doing a, something else. Yeah, it now become a regular Goryo. Goryo meaning five, five. But it's rings. still got those notches in the. You didn't do those. No. Those are notches that just develop naturally. Mm -hmm. God, that's so weird. Look at that beautiful pentagonal structure there. Okay, so she just told me the smell of the Kaput Medusa flowers the best. Out of all the astrophytum species, what? How would you just? How would you describe its smells? Like a sweet vanilla or something. Like vanilla, it's got like a vanilla tint to it. Yeah. So this is your soil. The raw, what are the raw ingredients you're using here, and what are the proportions? Okay, the proportions here is uh, seventy percent inorganic, and then thirty percent organic material. So this is my base mix for big asterias. Once they're already adult size. Yeah, like. Two inches diameter. Once I already got some one. moisture stored up in yeah. the stem. Yeah, so this is my mix. And so what is what is in here? What exactly so are the ingredients? I have a perlite, expandable expandable shell, pit moss because it's slightly acidic, the astrophytum like slightly acidic soil. And then I have coco coir here too, and then fine bark and uh, topsoil. Okay, but that expanded shale is pretty important, and the perlite, is, those are the inorganic ingredients. Yeah, and then um, when I transplant small seedlings, I add more... Um, organic material. Yeah, coco coir and pit moss to uh, retain more moisture. You're saying you don't really measure it out. It's not like a science. You just feel it. It's yeah, more like an art. It. Yeah, for the seedlings. Okay, and so what about for this too? Same thing, just kind of feel it, just rough idea. Yeah. Just you just know when it's good or yeah. not. Yeah. Before I'm so religious in measuring it, but it's right. like it's a lot of work. Most people I, I notice how they do, they just have feel it out. You yeah. Know? You know when yeah. it's right. So for seedling, you use a uh, instead of seventy thirty inorganic to organic, you use what like a sixty forty or yeah, that's it, sixty forty. So sixty percent inorganic, forty percent organic. Yeah. So this is what this is how you germinate them. Yeah. Basically. So how old are these guys? These are probably, oh, this is 2.5 months. Okay. Wow. All right. That's yeah. large. And so, but and of course you want to keep the humidity up. How long yeah. do you keep the humidity up? Like when will you take them out? After a year? After they reach a certain size mm. or what? After they reach certain size, for me, I'm confident at six months. Okay. Four to six months. But me handling so much seedling sometimes it goes seven months or something like right, that. right right but ideally if you got enough time and it's six yeah, months six months and the importance of doing this of course is they've got those stomata those gas pores and if they can keep them open all the time because humidity is up that means they can take in more carbon dioxide and they can grow faster all cacti do cam photosynthesis crash lacing acid metabolism taking carbon at night close their stomata during the day etc but they don't have to close it of course if the humidity is up. They can keep them open, which means if they keep them open, they can take CO2 in all the time, they can grow faster. Whereas if you were to take these out, half would probably die mm -hmm. at this age, and then the half that make it would just grow very slowly. Yeah. But of course, with this now, since the humidity is up, now you have to worry about rot. Mm -hmm. And so how do you deal with that? Do you ever Have you ever lost batches of seed to rot, to fungi and stuff like that? Or yeah, what? I do. Probably, um, well, part two from what's it, the birth pains of starting. Mm. But later on, you kind of like um, know how to do it. So once they get a certain size, 
I start opening the A little bag. bit, right, to get yeah. some airflow in there. Yeah. And that will reduce chances of rot, rot right? yeah. So this right here, this is an astrophytum. This is gymnocalycium. Yeah. And so, and of course, these are sealed on type. So you seal those on, you don't have to mess with it. You don't have to, as long as you don't have rot in there, you don't have to take, you don't have to uncover yeah. them. As long as I can see water, like this one here, mm -hmm. it means that they still have enough water there. So if I see it dry, I can water a little bit, but not very much. Mm -hmm. And do you water from the from bottom. the bottom? You water from the bottom. Yeah. Oh, I see. Maybe okay. Maybe in five months, I can water them one time. Do you do that with astros too? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you water from the bottom. That way, you don't have to get the surface wet. Yeah. The fungi don't. It's not. It's not soaking wet up top, so the fungus can't go nuts. Because that's what the fungus do. They eat the inorganic. Mm -hmm. They or they eat the organic material first, then they start moving on to the cactus. Yeah. Okay, so these are your stock plants. You got Myrtillo cactus right there, and you got Hilo cereus back there. And yeah. so, what do you? How do you grow these? You just basically just have it when they, once they get long enough, you prune them and then throw them and start another bucket, or what? Yeah, that's what I do. And so you use the Hilo cereus for the younger seedlings, and then the Myrtillo cactus for when they get a certain yeah. size. Yeah, that little anole just hanging out. A little lizard just kicking it. Look at it. He's comfortable. This one down here, this you said this is a Selena series. Yeah, Selena series grandiflorus, I believe, but I'm not so sure. Though. And so you use these for grafting stock too, but must be for like little guys, for seedlings, yeah, right? Yeah, for micro grafting, and then um, I don't know what's gonna the result will be. Mm -hmm. But you're trying everything out. Yeah. You're experimenting, so you don't just stick with one thing. That's pretty cool. Okay, yeah, I see. There you go. So you're the Selena here. So how old are these guys? Probably four months since grafted. Four months, and how much have they grown? Were they like half this size when you yeah, did them? Yeah, they doubled. Uh, what I noticed about the Selena series is it's not as fast as uh, the Hilo and the Martillo cactus, but it's giving me steady growth though. So you grafted all of these. How many plants do you think you've grafted in the last three years? Like a thousand, two thousand? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's the there's the stunner. Look at that guy. It's Caput Medusi. So are these all different seedlings? Yeah, those are seedlings. So they were all seed germinated yeah. and then grafted. Yeah, because um, I want to uh, harvest seeds from them, so I can't really uh, propagate same plant. So. They have to be different plants so that I can crossbreed them in the future. So how long does it take you to graft one of them? Like 45 seconds? To the time you make the cut to the time you get it taped up? Um, maybe one minute or two minutes. One I'm or not two really, minutes. I'm not really expert on grafting, but I have a lot of patience. You're not an expert. Seems to me you're an expert, okay? <laughs> I don't... It's <laughs> fucking... I mean, this is... I'm looking at like, you know, a thousand grafts you did. That's pretty impressive. Jesus Christ. Yeah, what's exciting for me is one day, you know, I, I, I'm I ready to degraft them and select the best um, phenotype in mm. the future. And this is just something you started doing during COVID for shits and giggles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, during That's the COVID, so I was man. heavy on sowing seeds. Uh -huh. And after a year, that I got into grafting because it's like, man, this seeds is slow. Right. So I got into grafting. Some people took up knitting. You took up uh, breeding, grafting, and uh, selecting for rare species of cacti. That's incredible. And you, you do it exceptionally well. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, too. So there you go. Nice little insight into how evolution works, all right? Because I see people on the channel all the time asking, you know, in cases of plants that mimic rocks, how does the plant know what a rock look like? It doesn't. It's just long amounts of time, chance mutation, and then... And then once something actually succeeds, it just exponentially, that allele that codes for that certain trait, just exponentially spreads, if it is successful, throughout the rest of the population. So much so to the point that eventually you get a new species. And so, you know, it's, of course, you know, nothing's simple but uh, regarding this, but that's a rough idea how it works. Look at all that, all that variation from a single species of cactus. All right, it really gives you an idea into how evolution works okay and how genetic variation works i always say human selection is a great way to teach natural selection all right because all humans are doing is basically they're doing what nature does 
but uh, not as efficiently, but in a much, uh, a much shorter period of time. So anyway, uh, that's all I got for you today. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Hopefully you gained something out of that. And, uh, you know, maybe someone out there will end up uh, doing what Madam Cacti here is doing. Uh, probably not as good as she's doing it, but maybe someone will uh, take it up and, uh, and uh, do it themselves. All right. All right. That's all I got. Have a good, uh, have a good rest of your day. Go fuck yourself. Bye.